Good morning, everybody. Welcome to South Lebanon. Come on, let's stand as we begin our time of worship. Amen. up for that today. Amen. You can all be seated. to your promises and we thank you for that we thank you this morning that you woke us up 
and allowed us to come and to worship. And we thank you that Jesus makes this all possible because of his death on the cross. And this morning, Lord, as we have come together and we're able to be together and to worship, I pray that our attentions would be upon Jesus, that we would exalt him as Lord and Savior. And Lord, we're mindful of those who can't be with us or are having issues physically that are giving them challenges this week or in the days ahead, and just pray that you would strengthen them, encourage them, comfort them, provide answers where answers are needed, provide direction where direction is needed. For those facing surgeries or procedures that, Lord, you would just allow them to trust you in the midst of this, and may you accomplish your purposes. Thank you for being a sovereign God in all things. Father, we're also thankful that you have blessed this church incredibly, and we thank you for that. Thank you that you have met our needs and gone beyond that. Thank you that we can partner with so many ministries locally and around the world, and I pray, God, that you would continue to use them for your honor and glory. Lord, I, I pray that as a church you would continue to guide us and direct us into the future for the leadership of this church, that you would direct us as to what your desires are. Lord, we pray that you would provide for us the additional staffing that we're asking for, individuals who will have a focus upon you as their Lord and Savior and cling to your word. And Lord, we pray too for our time together this morning that your word would have a powerful impact into our lives as it's open to us in a little bit. We also thank you, Lord, that you, you continue just to accomplish your plans and purposes in the world. And we pray for the various parts of the world that are struggling right now where there is unrest. May you bring peace. We pray for our nation, Lord, that you would bring a revival to our land. And we give you all the honor and glory, God, because you are worthy of that. So we just... Pray that you would be exalted right now in our time together. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue on in our worship service this morning, we're going to continue by celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Some call it the Lord's Supper. Some call it communion. Some refer to it as pew communion. This morning, I'm going to use a term called the Eucharist. It is a Greek term that is means really to give thanks. And so this morning, as we take the bread and the cup, what we're really doing is giving thanks to Jesus for what he has done for us on the cross. Because you see, there'd be no reason for us to be here this morning if it wasn't for Jesus. If he had not done that, we might as well wrap it up and go home. Okay? But Jesus went came to this earth, lived a sinless life, and shed his blood on the cross in order to pay the penalty for our sins so that we can be declared justified by God's grace through faith. And that word justice is an interesting word because you hear it used a lot right now in our culture. People are crying out for justice for various things. Uh, on my way here this morning, I saw a sign down here on Lincoln Avenue uh, said justice for Gunner. And Gunner is a dog that was shot by the Lebanon City Police this week in an altercation. And you see, people want justice, but really, if they're really to get the justice, real true justice, you're going to have to look at, at God. You're going to have to look at his word. Because true justice is only going to come through Jesus Christ. Paul wrote this in Romans 3, 22 to 25. The righteousness, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And you see, all of us, every last one of us sitting here, if we had to somehow 
be right in front of God on the merits of ourselves, we couldn't do it. But Jesus, by his death on the cross, declared every one of us just, right with God, through faith. And so this morning, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and you have trusted Jesus for your salvation, I invite you and encourage you to take the bread and the cup. I also, if you have not trusted Jesus as your savior in love, I ask you not to do that. Because this is for those who have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. And I see Jeff over here to my left. And if you have not gotten the bread and cup, raise your hand, Jeff has it. And uh, Fawn's over here as well. This morning we're gonna take a look a little bit at 1 Corinthians because Paul also gave some direction to the church at Corinth on how they should take the bread and the cup. He gave some instructions. And one of those instructions is found in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, where he says this, Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, we don't know all the circumstances surrounding why Paul wrote this, but you know, as we look at it, we do know that there, there probably were a couple things that were going on there in the church. First of all, people were coming to a service like this, a time of the bread and the cup, and possibly were not thinking of the significance of what Jesus did for them. Kind of coming and going, oh, this is great, we'll do this this morning, and then we'll just get on with life. We shouldn't be doing that. But we should be thinking and contemplating exactly what Christ did for us. And we're going to do that as we take the bread and the cup this morning. There's another thing that Paul may have been thinking about. And we do talk about this sometimes. But we need to examine ourselves because sometimes even as believers, we all fall. And we sin. And we know that sin presents a barrier between us and God, and we need to, to, you know, to take a look at that. And, and, first, and in 1 John, John wrote, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we, we should stop, and we, we should be taking this bread and cup in a worthy manner because the consequences to the church at Corinth were this. There were some who were sick and some who were dying because of not taking it in a worthy manner. So this morning... I ask you two questions. Number one, do you really understand the significance of what you're doing? And number two, is there any sin in your life? And I'm going to ask you to just take a, a moment or two right now and to examine yourself before we take the bread and the cup. Would you do that right now? Father, we thank you that you made it possible for us to have a relationship with you and to experience eternity with you because of Jesus. Because if it was up to us, none of us would make it. None of us would be found worthy. None of us would be found guiltless. But we thank you this morning that we can come to this time and to remember what Jesus did for us and to realize that you provided a suitable perfect sacrifice that would pay the price for our sins provide atonement for us and we thank you for that God please help us as we spend this time and contemplate what Jesus did for us that we would not take it lightly we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you to open up your little baggie there and pull out the bread and, and hold it in your hand and examine it, begin to look at it. And I, I want you to understand that this is just a simple cracker. Nothing significant about it. Okay? It probably doesn't have a whole lot of nutritional value, but what it does have is a deep spiritual reality, a simple symbol of a deep spiritual reality and that deep spiritual reality is that this represents the body of Christ the 
body of Christ. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and 24 to the church there at Corinth. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a moment, we're going to take and eat this bread together in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. And before we do that, I'm going to pray. But then as we eat the bread together, and I'll have a few instructions after I pray, I want you to examine the bread as you eat it and think about the fact of the reality that Jesus Christ, his body was beaten, beaten, bruised, and the writer of Isaiah says, crushed for you. That's what he endured for you, and this represents that. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you. You were so willing to come to this earth. You lived a sinless life. You lived a perfect life as an example for us. Writer of Hebrews tells us that you were without sin, and that is the only way that your father could be satisfied and justice be declared upon us is because of your sinlessness. And thank you that you shed your blood on the cross for us. Your body was beaten for us so that we could have life eternal and have a relationship with you and with your Father. So Jesus, we thank you for coming to this earth. We thank you for willingly hanging on that cross. We thank you for taking the suffering that we rightly deserve. This bread which we break is a communion of the body of Christ. And, and I encourage you to think about the body of Christ that was beaten, bruised, and broken, and smashed, and crushed for you as you take it. Take the bread and eat it. Now I encourage you to take the cup out of your baggie. Take the label off the cup and hold it in your hand. Again, there's nothing mystical, magical about this. This is just simple grape juice. Again, the process of making grape juice is pretty simple. And um, it's something very, very simple. But it has a deep spiritual reality. The deep spiritual reality is that Jesus' blood was shed for you. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11.25, again giving instruction to the church there, in the same way he also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as, you know, in a moment we're going to pray for this cup, and then we're going to drink the cup together. But I, here's what I would like to encourage you to do this morning. I would like, as you take the cup, I would like to encourage you to think about the fact that this represents the blood of Jesus Christ that was spilt on the ground for you. Sometimes we have a pretty um, lofty picture of Christ and we don't see the blood and we don't see the suffering. But the reality is his blood was poured out on the ground for you. It ran down his arms, it ran down his side, it ran down his legs, it came out of the nail wounds in, in his hands and feet for you. It's a pretty grotesque thing. But yet the reality is, and the writer of Hebrews says this, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. So we're gonna pray for the cup and then a word of instruction, and we're going to drink the cup together. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you willingly sent your son to this earth. And Jesus, I thank you that you willingly came. And I thank you that you 
were nailed to that cross and that your blood came out of those nail wounds and where the sword was thrust into your side I thank you that you did that in order to pay the ransom for our sins I thank you that you were perfect and because you were perfect we can now have a right relationship with your father this cup which we bless as a communion of the blood of Christ. I encourage you to drink the cup and think about the blood of Christ that was shed on for you. Paul gave one more word of instruction to the church there in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 that I want to point out. And that is, he said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The reality is that until the day that we're taken up into heaven, we're to continue to remember what Jesus did for us. And we can do it every time we take the bread and drink the cup. And I would encourage us to continue to proclaim what Jesus did for us until the day he returns. I want to invite everybody back to our feet. Let's continue in worship as we respond to this gift of Christ.
share a couple announcements with you this morning. It's already gone, but we had a rosebud this, here this morning for uh, the Adam and Cassandra Light family. They had a daughter born to them on June 29th, and we had another baby born yesterday to James and Daniela Martin, and there'll be a rosebud here next week to celebrate that. We congratulate them. A couple of things coming up in the next couple of weeks here that we want to make you aware of. On July 31st, it's going to be a full day. Uh, first of all, in the morning, it's Mission Sunday, and we really encourage you to be here. Uh, I know maybe you just like to come at 1045, but we would really encourage you to come to some of the other times that we have that day, 830, 930, and 1045, because it's going to be basically one big service in three different segments. And what we're going to do is have a bunch of our missionaries here in the room, and some of our missionaries will be on Skype, and we'll be getting some updates as to what God is doing in the lives and the ministries of those that we support here at SLCC. Do want to let you know that on that day, there will be no Sunday school classes for the adults at 930, and there will be nursery care provided all, all three services and for the children there will only be kids worship at 1045 service then in the afternoon on the 31st uh, there will be an outdoor baptism held at the Boyd's home at three o'clock we encourage you to come to that number of people are being baptized that day and then hang around there'll be a meal following the baptism and we encourage you to bring your lawn chairs and come and be a part of that special day if you have your Bible we're going to read from Acts chapter 11, verses 27 to 30 in preparation for our message this morning. Follow along on the screen, follow along on your phone or your iPad, whatever you have. But Acts chapter 11, verse 27 to 30, and beginning of verse 27, it says this. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the, so the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And this is our scripture for this morning. And Charlie's going to come and speak to us from this passage this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be together with you again this morning. Hey, I want to introduce you to two young ladies here. Sue Falk and Carmen Passio. Would you make your way up front here? They're here somewhere. There they are. You sat in the back. <laughs> Come on up, ladies. Just come on up here. We're not going to let you stand down on the floor. We're going to bring you up here. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. <laughs> this is Carmen. This is Sue. Come over this way. I'm, uh, yeah, it's, she's afraid of me. I ah, know better than that. Hey, these are two of those that are going to be baptized on July 31st. Would you celebrate that with me? <laughs> we just rejoice in that, you guys. We really do. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is going to be an exciting day. I hope you'll come and be part of it. I'm telling you what, we got them from all ages. I think the youngest is seven, and I won't tell you how the oldest is, okay? That's how I stay alive. And uh, just, just want you to know it's going to be a wonderful celebration. And again, yeah, afterwards, it, the baptism, the time of fellowship, it's just a fun day. So I hope you'll come and be with us on that day. Pray you have your Bibles along with you or something you can look at, follow these verses of Scripture along with some other ones. I think it's been at least five years ago, maybe longer than that, that there was a, a family that started worshiping with us, and we found out that they had some needs, some, some needs for just some basic food stuff. So we announced one Sunday that the next Sunday we're going to put a big box out here in the North X. And if you have anything you'd like to bring, canned goods or anything that's not perishable and stuff like that, to share with this family to bring it. I was blown away what happened the next Sunday. 
I mean, we had a big box. That box was filled to overflowing all the way down the hallways, everything else. When we took the stuff over, I'm told that I don't think it all fit in one of the trucks, the pickup trucks that we had. It was amazing and wonderful to see the outpouring of love and support and encouragement for this family. But since that time, when a tornado hit, we raised an offering. When a flood hit or a hurricane, we raised an offering. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Ukraine, the crisis is happening over there. We sent money through Samaritan's Purse to help for relief for the people in Ukraine. If you didn't realize this, you should. There were $61,000 raised for that. Amazing. The compassion, yeah, I tell you what, it's phenomenal. As your pastor, I am blessed to be in a role of leadership with a congregation that has that kind of compassion. Now, what we're going to look at today is a church up in Antioch who finds out of a need of the church down in Jerusalem and how they provided for that. May we as a church always follow this example when we see those in need. That's what I want you to think about, how we respond when we see those in need and how, what we do about that. Verse 27, look there with me if you would. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Remember, when we talk about Scripture and we talk about coming down, remember, Antioch is to the north of Jerusalem. But when we talk about elevation, they were coming from a higher elevation in Jerusalem down to Antioch, okay? So even though it's to the north, 300 miles, that's what's happening. Now, if you remember, if you've been with us the last couple of months, we've talked about this multiple times. In Jerusalem, the church is predominantly Jews that are now followers of Jesus Christ. In Samaria, predominantly those who were half Jew and half Gentile. In Antioch and some of these other places, predominantly Gentiles. So I want you to understand what's happening. A church full of Gentiles is going to hear about the need that a church full of Jews is having, and you're going to see something. The walls are coming down. Remember, we talked about that before, the, the attitude that the Jews had towards the Gentiles and the Gentiles towards the Jews. Those walls are coming down through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Christians help one another in different places in the world and different situations also. I want you to have that mindset. We help others. That's the way it should be, okay? Whether it's in Haiti or whether it's in India or whether it's in Philadelphia, wherever there's a need, we get involved in that process because when we have a need, they also help us. This was demonstrated in a beautiful way, that aspect of helping one another years ago, many years ago, went down to Kentucky, Kentucky Mountain Housing Project. If you're not aware of that, it helps build homes for people who are very much in poverty. So we go down there, we're, we're building this house for this guy, and he shows up one day, and he's so thrilled that we're building a house for, uh, for him, he wants to do something for us. And he, and he comes up with something, goes, hey, he said, just a day or so ago, I killed a rattlesnake. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to roast some of that up for you guys tomorrow. Now, I'm all about killing snakes. <laughs> if you've been here any period of time, you know how I'm not all about eating snakes. And thankfully, he forgot or didn't have to get it done or whatever, but they, he never showed up with the snakes. But what I want you to understand is something is the compassion when you see somebody doing something you want to help and you want to respond in such a way. So you need to see something. Remember, at Antioch, they needed help when the believers came to Christ. They called to Jerusalem. Jerusalem sent those up to disciple them and help them. Now there's going to be another need that's going to arise, and that need is going to be something that's going to take place there in the church of Jerusalem. A famine's going to hit. Let's look at this. Verse 28. It says this, And one of the, them named Agabus stood up, foretold by the Spirit, that there would be a great famine over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Agabus is a, is a, a, a prophet here used by God. He's used also, if you want to look there, Acts chapter 21. We'll get this to this after a while. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. He, he again speaks on behalf of God as a prophet. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he looked at Paul's belt. He took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. What we see here really quite often as prophets of, the, uh, of Scripture, prophets of God, they will also often give a warning of what's about to happen or what's about to take place and what they be prepared for. And here we see the aspect of Agabus saying there's going to be a famine. Now, again, these are things that, that we are not very familiar with, 
but have happened evidently quite often now through the course of history. Warren Wiersbe pointed out that during the, the reign of Claudius Caesar, there were four different famines that are, that are documented by historians of that time. Now, the historian, the historian Josephus, Josephus said one of these was so bad that many people died in Jerusalem. And it is believed that this is the famine we're talking about, that kind of death. Now, during a famine, the little food that there was available would become extremely expensive. Now, this is where I want you to start this morning. I said this, and I apologize if anybody fit in a different situation than this, but I think I'm talking to a group of people, myself included, that have never really been hungry. We have never been in a place of starvation. We've never been in a place that we, we have not been able to eat for days or weeks at a time. I'm pretty sure I'm speaking to a group of people. Probably, probably the most hunger we ever experienced is when we're on a diet. All right? and, and, and a bunch of us fall in that category. You know, got to knock a couple pounds off, something like that. That's the only time we've ever been hungry. So even when we read these verses of Scripture, it's hard for us to fully fathom what this must have been like. That these people were so hungry, and, and some of them would be dying, and tragically, a lot of times, that would be children that would be dying. Now, we are so unfamiliar with shortages that we, we get shocked by it. We went through that with, uh, with COVID, didn't we? Supply chain issues. It was shocking for us to go to a grocery store or go to a store somewhere, and the things that we always had are not there, right? I mean, it, it, was, it was very, very difficult for us to even comprehend the fact that, that there would be something that we can't have that we want. We are so spoiled in this country. We have so much in this country that, that it's odd for us. But we find it hard to believe or hard to understand what it's like to not have something to eat and to not have enough to eat that you actually end up dying from it. But that's what's going to happen here in Jerusalem. I also want you to know that this is something that is foretold that will happen sometime in this world that we live in. There's a tribulation period coming, all right? I believe the church will be taken out before that. I believe the rapture of the church will precede that. There'll be seven years like have never been seen by mankind. And during that seven years, a large part of the population will die and millions will die as a result of famine and pestilence. So I, I want you to understand something. That time is coming. For the believers will be spared that. For the non-believers who are left, they will see things like they never, ever thought they would see. Jesus talked about that. Prophetically, these are things that he shared. Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read verses 21 and 22 to you. You should read the whole chapter, okay? For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for that sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So what I would like you to see is this. We have not experienced that kind of a famine. That kind of famine will take place. And the reality is simply this. That day's coming. Now, what we, I do want you to see is the believers in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, the Christians in Jerusalem, they are going to suffer. They're going to find themselves in a situation where there's going to be desperation. There's going to be a lack of food. There's going to be a lack of funds to buy those food. And, and the church at Antioch is being aware of that. And the church at Antioch wants to do something about it. Listen, when it's going, what is going to happen is the Gentiles are going to help the Jews in Jerusalem. A great demonstration of unity. That is a beautiful thing. They hear about the need. They understand the need. And they're saying, okay, we as Gentiles want to help these Jewish brothers and sisters out, and we're going to send them help to have that accomplished. Now listen, oftentimes what happens, we are focused upon ourselves, and, and when we think we can't get something, then we become desperate to get it. Uh, how much toilet paper do you have in your house right now? Uh, did, did you ever expect that kind of a run on toilet paper? And the reality simply was, you could have two cases at home, but if you went to the store and lo and behold, there's four rolls in that, you're going to grab them four rolls, right? That kind of desperation that I want to make sure I have enough. Now you stop and you apply that to the aspect of food. We haven't been down that road yet. Maybe we will. But I just want you to understand how difficult it is. Now, as I read stories and talk to those who had lived through the Depression, I understand that at those times there was those kind of, of desperation. In fact, when I read of a story of a man, a father, who was weeping 
And his father was weeping because he worked all week and all he could afford was one head of cabbage to feed his family. One head of cabbage to feed his family for a whole week. I also have heard people tell me this, and I was shocked by it, the number of people during the Depression who would eat groundhogs. Now, that's not sausage. I'm not talking about ground pig. I'm talking about those animals that live in holes underground, and you run over every once in a while while you're driving down the road, okay? They, they would not waste a groundhog because it was food. It was a way for them to survive. I don't think any of us have been in those kind of situations. <laughs> One guy told me after the first service, he goes, you know what? He said, I'd rather eat rattlesnake and groundhog. I said, I ate groundhog. I'd rather eat groundhog than rattlesnake, okay? But the reality is simply this. We're not used to that kind of desperation. People before us have been, been in that situation. People after us will be in that situation also. 300 miles away, they understand there's going to be a need. The church in Antioch wants to do something. Verse 29, look there with me if you would. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Man, this is, this is a beautiful thing. They, they are realizing the fact that there's need there, and they want to do something about it. Now, I've had a lot of people that are confused about this. They say, well, you know what? Really, communism is very much like Christianity. And if you're here this morning thinking that, I want to, I want to correct something. I want you to understand they are, they are nothing alike. First off, communism is uh, atheist or agnostic. And, and I want you to understand something. We, what we do is, is by the grace of God. In fact, the differences between Christianity and communism, with communism, you take from everyone else and give it to who you want to give it to. If you study, if you do the research, you will find that communist leaders who would take food and wealth and stuff from everyone else would make sure that they were provided for first. They never went hungry. And they would give it to the people that they deemed, I guess, necessary or the ones that they felt they could get some kind of benefit from. This is the way... Christians are supposed to do this as far as giving and caring. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Paul says this. For each one of us must give what he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's the way we give. We give because we have a love, we have a compassion, we have a concern, because the Holy Spirit convicts us of that. You know, hey, uh, there, there are so, so many things, because as I look at this and we see how God laid upon the heart of Agabus to tell the congregation that, hey, you know what? There's this desperate famine coming, and it all worked out. That's the way God does stuff. I read a story years ago about a missionary family that was in a third world country, and it was a very hot, humid area, okay? And what happened is their daughter became very, very ill with an earache, a very, very intense earache. And they knew that if they had a water bottle, a hot water bottle, that they could use that and relieve some of the pain. Now, a lot of you don't even know what a hot water bottle is anymore. But the reality is simply this. This family needed a hot water bottle, but they're in an area where it's hot and humid. Nobody would sell or have or even want a hot water bottle in that area. But they realized the fact that they had to plead with God to get it. Now, you need to understand stuff. The things that came from America to them, people who sent them stuff, it would be at least a month or six weeks for that to happen, okay? Until they packaged it up, until they shipped it there, it would take that long for them to get them. So what this family did in desperation, they pleaded with God, Lord, we need a hot water bottle. We do not see any way possible for that hot water bottle to happen, but you're God, you can do anything. The next day, a package shows up from the United States, from family and friends. Now, that package was shipped, again, a month, six weeks before. They start pulling this apart, and you know what's in the bottom of that box? A hot water bottle. God knew their needs long before they knew their needs. And God provided in a way that's really miraculous. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God we have. So the church at Antioch realizes that, and they are going to do something about it. It's beautiful to see the number of people that are being used by God all over this world, and it's beautiful to see people come alongside of them and say, I want to do something about that. You know, one of the things that, that strikes my heart, and that's what Paul's saying, you know what, you're not, you, we're not telling you to give out of compulsion. We're telling you to give out of the love of your, life, of your heart. When, when I see some of the things that I see and read some of the things I read, I naturally say, I want to help those folks out. Years ago, Independent Church of India was here, and they showed a video of what they're doing in India. And the moment I seen that, I realized I want to help these folks out. They were going to leper colonies in India. 
And this is the lowest of the lows. These are the untouchables. These are people that no one else wants anything to do with. And the results of leprosy is they're missing hands, they're missing fingers, they're missing their legs. Some are missing ears, some are missing a nose. That's what leprosy does. And they showed a picture of a guy that I'll never forget because he had his hands wrapped with cloths because that's how he got around because he was missing both legs up to his hips. And the way he got around was he used his hands to pick himself up. There's no wheelchair, nothing else. Just to survive, just to have enough food to survive was a struggle. And you know what? When I see it on the screen that they're going to reach these people and they're helping to feed these people or clothe these people, there was, there was a compassion in my heart and I want to be involved in that process. And that's the way it should be. When you see people's physical needs, you see their spiritual needs, you're saying, you know what? I want to do something about that. And that's what happened to the church at Antioch. When they heard about the desperation that was going to come upon the church in Jerusalem, they said, I want to do something about that. And they got involved and they did something. Oh, when we hear those stories like that, I hear the need. It should, open, it should put a, a desire upon our hearts. Verse 30, look there with me if you would. It says this, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So this is the deal. There was no credit cards. There was no traveler's checks. There was no way for, us to, for them to move a large amount of money from Antioch to Jerusalem. The way that it had to be done is this offering was lifted, and now Paul and Barnabas, actually, uh, you know, Saul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, talk about the same person. They're given this money, and they're going to be responsible for taking that 300 miles. This is not going to be an easy task, you guys. I want you to understand it's going to be a challenge. And, it's, and, and I want you to understand they wanted to make sure that it got there right. Now, today, we got all kinds of stuff happening in our society. we got a, all kinds of deceitful things taking place. In fact, when I heard of one organization that had run TV commercials to send money and found that in the end, okay, the amount of money that actually got to the people they said they were trying to help was 10 cents on the dollar. That's not acceptable. It shouldn't, shouldn't be acceptable to you. It's not acceptable to me. So it's wise for us and important for us to know where our money's going and making sure that it's handled properly. In fact, it's good and right to check to see where your money is going and that it is being cared for properly. Wherever you give your money to do kingdom work, and that's the way we're looking at it, wherever you give your money to do kingdom work, they should be able to tell you how much is being given, where, how it's being used, and how it's being distributed. And if they're not willing to tell you that, then I'd find someone else to give your money to. The reality is simply this, the money that you would give to this congregation and the mission work that we're doing here ultimately can see exactly how much is given to who, when, and how that's all worked out. But now they needed somebody to get this money down to Jerusalem, and they needed someone there to distribute it. So how is it going to be done? It's going to be done by taking it to and giving it to the elders, and then the elders are going to be responsible. Your elders should be trustworthy people. I believe the elders of this church are trustworthy people. In fact, if I had a suitcase full of $100,000 of unmarked bills, I would give it to any one of our elders and say, hang on to it for a year. And a year later, I think I'd get it back with all the money. They might even put, put a couple bucks in there for me. I don't know. But the reality is simply this. They are trustworthy individuals. And that's the kind of leadership you should have. That's the kind of leadership you should call out. It's going to be a long, artist trip, 300 miles, over difficult terrain, over places where there are robbers and thieves waiting to attack them. They need to take this money, get it there safely, and then give it to the brothers and sisters there in Jerusalem. It was going to be dangerous, but it was going to be something that was going to bring great joy. Can you imagine when they get there with it? Can you imagine people who are living in desperate circumstances, not having enough food to eat, not having enough to even uh, survive, and now being given this money? What a wonderful blessing. What a wonderful gift. That is, I will tell you this, that's, and having the opportunity to do that, when you are able to give to those people who are in need, it is a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. So there's the aspect of giving money. There's the aspect of giving time. There's the aspect of giving anything that God has blessed us with to help someone else. I'll, I'll finish this up with a true example again of that and a pretty interesting thing as far as I'm concerned. Tyler Moon uh, was a young man, 25 years old. He's going to run a 10-mile race. He lines up for that 10-mile race. You know how they give you those, those, uh, those uh, uh, pieces of paper or cloth that have your number on, okay? Now, this, this Tyler, he loved Jesus, and he decided that he's going to put a, a note on there, and under his number, he wrote, Jesus saves. 
And he takes off, lines up, starts off the race, running the race. Eight miles into the race, this 25-year-old healthy man falls down with a heart attack. Right behind him, by the sovereign hand of God, is also another young man who is not only a registered nurse, but an anesthetist. And he comes up and starts to doing CPR on Tyler right away. And, and between, Todd, between him and, and a couple other people, Tyler's life is saved. Do you want to know what the guy's name is who's the registered nurse who's doing CPR? Jesus. J-E-S-U-S. Jesus. So Tyler has Jesus saves. And Jesus made sure that Jesus is there doing the CPR, and it all works out pretty good. His life is saved. Ah, you know what? We serve an amazing God. He's doing amazing things. He's doing amazing things. And you and I are part of that process. Just as the church of Antioch had compassion for the church in Jerusalem, we as believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we see other people throughout the world, wherever they might be, okay, whatever their needs might be, whatever the circumstance might be, we need to be involved in that process of reaching people for Christ, helping to meet their physical needs, and, and always helping to meet their spiritual needs. Man, God's doing great stuff. And he wants to do even more through you and me. The needs are all around us. We just need to be willing to serve as God opens those doors. Pray with me if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to gather this morning. We thank you for the believers at Antioch and their compassion for the believers in Jerusalem. And may we also walk in such a way that we have love and compassion for those that we see in need. When those circumstances arise, Lord, may we be the first ones to make sure that those needs are provided for. So lead, guide, and direct us as a church. May we continue to do kingdom work until that moment you take us home to be with you. This will be my prayer, Lord. For I ask it in your name and for your sake, Jesus. Amen. David, would you stand with us as we close today's service?
Jesus from the mountains, with Jesus in the streets, and Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name.